Welcome back to Anatomy and Physiology One Laboratory. I'm Kevin Tokoff, and in this video we're going to go over some of the major concepts from Exercise 2, which has to deal with organ systems, but also feedback loops, homeostasis, and divisions of the body, as in cavities and membranes, so on and so forth. Let's first talk about an overview of some of the, of the organ systems of the body. And some of these we'll be covering in A&P1, and the rest you'll cover in the second semester of the course. And I'm just going to go over some of the very basic information that you would need to know. First, let's talk about the integumentary system, which consists mainly of the skin, but also of the hair on your body and the nails on your fingers and toes. The integumentary system really is just a big protective barrier for the body. It prevents deeper tissues underneath the skin, for example, from getting injured. It also prevents dehydration. Now, one of the other important things that the skin does is it's instrumental in the formation of vitamin D, which is necessary for life and health. All right. Moving on to the nervous system, we'll also cover this in this course. The nervous system is all about detection of stimuli, both external and internal. And in terms of detection, um, we're talking about so sensory, so detecting something's hot, perceiving a color with your vision, but also control of movement. So when you move your arms to write on a test, that's um, initiated by the nervous system. And we can consider the brain, the spinal cord, and every neuron in your body and also all the sensory organs, all right? Also covered in this course is going to be the muscular system, and this, I think, pretty much speaks for itself. It's the muscles, and the muscles move the body. They are the direct movers of the body. The muscles are actually going to pull on bones, which we'll look at next, to produce movement. Another thing that you should be aware of is the muscles also generate heat. They have a very high metabolic rate, and so heat is produced by muscles. Now, if you get a question on a quiz or exam that says which system generates movement, you go with the muscles, okay? It is true muscles pull on bones, and it is true that the nervous system initiates movements, but the direct generators of the movement are the muscles, okay? Also, we'll cover in this class the skeletal system, which is really just bones, okay? And the bones provide support, and they protect internal body parts. For example, the rib cage protects the heart and the lungs. The skull obviously protects the brain, okay? And like I said, because muscles pull on bones, the bones serve as points of attachment for muscles, okay? And the skeletal system also produces many blood cells, all right? Now, the rest of these are covered in the second semester of this course. Here's the circulatory system. This is mainly involved in transporting nutrients of all kinds, and waste for that matter, throughout the body. So, for example, the heart beats, which pumps blood, and that moves through all these blood vessels to give, say, oxygen and glucose to your cells in the periphery. Okay, so this is all about nutrient transport. All right? Endocrine system. Endocrine system is a system of the body that consists of organs all over the place and tissues, um, and they produce hormones. And these hormones can act in different ways and control different aspects of the body. One hormone that you've probably heard of is insulin. So the pancreas releases insulin, and that causes uh, cells to uptake glucose from the blood. All right? So the endocrine system makes all sorts of different kinds of hormones, which you'll cover in ANP2. All right? Lymphatic system, often a neglected system. It's probably one of the most boring systems, if we're being honest. But the lymphatic system is all about fluid collection and fluid return. So in your uh, blood vessels, obviously, there's blood. And lymphatic vessels run with all the blood vessels. They run, kind of run next to them. And the lymphatic vessels pick up any excess fluid that, that would drain out of the blood vessels. It picks it up and returns it back to the circulation. Okay. Also, the lymphatic system can defend the body against infection, all right? Here we have the respiratory system, and you might guess it involves the lungs and all the airways up here that lead up to the mouth, all right? So the respiratory system is mainly involved in when you inhale, you intake oxygen, which will then be distributed to your tissues, but also the respiratory system, when you exhale, it gets rid of waste, such as carbon dioxide. So the respiratory system both helps you receive nutrients from the air, as in oxygen, but also get rid of waste like carbon dioxide, okay? The digestive system, you have all these organs in here. We have the esophagus, the stomach, the liver, all the intestines in here. The digestive system is obviously involved in 
breaking nutrients down that we eat so that they can be absorbed into the bloodstream and utilized by all the tissues of the body. So we break things down and we absorb them, right? And also in terms of the rectum and the end of the colon, the digestive system helps eliminate waste as fecal matter, right? Now the urinary system, this first of all helps maintain the blood volume, that's part of it, and the composition of the blood, but whenever there's excess wastes in your blood, the urinary system filters it out and you basically urinate the waste away. So the urinary system is the main system involved in regulating waste from your internal environment, such as the blood. All right, And then I don't think we need to go much into the reproductive system, but in terms of specifics, the male reproductive system is going to produce hormones and sperm cells for their half of the reproduction, and female reproductive system is going to produce eggs and hormones such as estradiol, a type of estrogen, and uh, so on and so forth for their half of reproduction. All right, And also, hormones produced from these areas can also trigger secondary sex characteristics. Again, just kind of know a basic amount of each of these organ systems, okay? All right, now let's talk about homeostasis and feedback loops. So the body needs to maintain any physiological variable within a healthy range of normal values. And here you have a graph kind of illustrating this. Any physiological variable, such as blood pressure or blood glucose, anything, has to be maintained within a pretty narrow range of values. So down here at this dotted line on the bottom, that's maybe the lower limit, and up here is the upper limit for a healthy range. And as long as you're in this range in blue, you're healthy. Let's say this is blood pressure. We know that throughout the day blood pressure goes up and down. For example, when you have to slam on your brakes to avoid a crazy driver, your blood pressure probably goes up. Then if you sit down for a little bit, you know, and you're relaxing, if you don't have an exam or whatever, your blood pressure probably goes down and it cycles up and up and down and down and so on and so forth. And only when you generally get into these higher areas, or in some cases very low areas, do you have the possibility of disease. And so in order to maintain homeostasis, you have to have what are called negative feedback systems or negative feedback loops. So over here is kind of a general uh, diagram of a feedback loop, and this one is really more or less a negative feedback loop. So let's talk about it. So homeostasis is when we're balanced, all right? So what happens if we tip this uh, seesaw out of balance? So in other words, we produce an imbalance. Well, something like a receptor is going to detect that change. It's going to detect that deviation from homeostasis or that imbalance. And then the information is going to be sent to a control center. And many times the control center is the brain, but it doesn't have to be. In the case of blood glucose levels, the control center is actually the pancreas. And then that control center is going to send information to some effector, some output information that says, here's what we need to do to fix the problem. And then the effector actually does fix the problem by doing some action. And then the imbalance will be corrected back to homeostasis, okay? So again, to reiterate this. So if we get out of homeostasis, whatever the variable is that changes, it's detected. The information is sent to a control center, then the control center sends information out to some effector, which is just a term for something that is able to respond to the change and change the imbalance back to a balance or homeostasis. Now, the most common type of feedback loop that we have like this is that of negative feedback. So here's a key concept. Negative feedback is a feedback loop in which the original stimulus is reversed to return the body to homo homeostasis. So if our imbalance initially right here was high blood glucose, the end result of negative feedback would be lowered blood glucose. So if we're on this graph right here and our blood glucose starts to rise a lot, like up to right here where my mouse is, the negative feedback would cause it to come back down. Okay. Likewise, if our blood glucose starts falling because we are fasting, then glucagon, another hormone, would be released and we'd bring it back up. And that bringing back up is another type of negative feedback. So the original stimulus or the original imbalance 
is reversed with negative feedback. So if you start with a variable, whatever that physiological variable is, is too high, negative feedback will bring it down. If that physiological variable is too low, negative feedback will bring it back up. So I've got this thing right here. So the example, acutely elevated blood glucose is decreased back to normal levels by the action of insulin. So the key with negative feedback is you may start with an increase, but then the negative feedback will decrease it back to normal. Or if you start with a decreased level of something, negative feedback will increase it back to normal. The response for negative feedback is always opposite because only by doing the opposite can you bring it back to uh, a healthy level, to homeostasis. Okay. Now, another type of feedback loop is positive feedback. And this is where the original stimulus is amplified rather than reversed. Okay. So it's sort of like if you start with two of something, You'll then go to 4, and then 8, and then 16, and you keep getting more and more and more of something. A great classic example of positive feedback is during childbirth. Whenever a baby is being birthed, the oxytocin levels by the mother increase more and more and more and more. So you start with a little oxytocin, and it just keeps increasing until you have a ton of oxytocin. Okay, And it keeps going and going and going and going, up and up and up. Now there is a way to shut it off, but we're not gonna talk about that. The key with positive feedback is the original stimulus is amplified, whereas with negative feedback, the original stimulus is reversed. So in negative feedback, if it goes up, then it goes back down, or if it starts going down, it goes back up. So hopefully that makes a little bit of sense. Now let's move on to body cavities. So a body cavity is just a space. And they're not necessarily empty, they have things in them. For example, I think we know the cranial cavity probably has the brain in it. But these cavities are just spaces where things might be stored. Here's a lateral view of a person. Let's look at some of the cavities you can see from this view. Obviously in the skull we have the cranial cavity. Okay, And notice we also have a vertebral cavity, which is basically a cavity that runs ultimately through the spine. Okay. Down here we have a green, the pelvic cavity, and in pink right here, the abdominal cavity. And sometimes you'll see the abdominal cavity and pelvic cavity combined into one term called abdominopelvic cavity. But understand this is a conglomerate of these two individual ones, abdominal and pelvic. All right. Now, if we look in the upper chest area, if we look in the anterior view, we can see some more things. So for example, in purple here, that's approximately where each lung is, right? So each of these is actually what we call a pleural cavity. So plural is the word that generally means lungs. So if you see pleura, plural, you're talking about the lungs. Here we have in green, sort of this bluish green, this is the pericardial cavity. Okay, so pericardial means heart. In fact, really the cardia is what means heart, but we call this the pericardial cavity right here in bluish green. And up here at the top in orange, this is what's called the, the superior mediastinum. Okay, now you'll be asked about the different cavities, which one each is, um, make sure you default to your lab manual to know which one of these, which ones of these cavities are ones that are important for you to know. Now, what's also important about body cavities is that they tend to be lined by membranes called serous membranes. Now, let's talk about what a membrane actually is. Okay, when you usually think of membrane, you think of the cell membrane. Well, a membrane is not just that. A membrane is anything that covers something else. Technically, your skin is a membrane. It covers your whole body. If you want to think of the bottle cap of a water bottle, that could be a membrane, so to speak. It covers something, okay? So membranes just cover something. And serous membranes lie in these cavities. Now, you're going to come across two terms in A&P, only one of which we're covering here, and that's serous membranes. Serous membranes are a type of membrane that do not open to the outside, meaning there's no possible opening for the external environment to be connected to these membranes, okay? In contrast to mucous membranes, which do open to the outside. We won't talk about those yet. Serous membranes do not open to the outside, and they line all of these cavities. Let's talk about this, the serous membranes that are important for us. So we have over here the pericardial area. These are the pericardial membranes. Here are pleural membranes, because these are the lungs. And in terms of the abdominal pelvic cavity, these membranes are called peritoneum, okay? Now, 
there's parietal and visceral of each. Parietal, visceral, we have parietal and visceral. How do you tell the difference in which one is which? All right. The parietal always lines the wall of the cavity. If we go back over here and look at the pleural area, the membrane, the serous membrane that lines the cavity, where we could say that is the most superficial membrane, is always the parietal. Okay? The parietal is always the most superficial. The visceral membrane, in each case, lines the surface of the organ. I think you can see it best with this heart, so let's look at this. Notice the parietal membrane, which in this case, because they're pericardium, you call it parietal pericardium. Notice it lines the outermost superficial part of the heart, whereas the visceral pericardium, visceral is lining the actual organ itself. And that's a key thing to remember. Visceral always lines the organ. Parietal always is superficial to that, normally on the wall of the cavity. Okay? If we look at the lungs down here, now we change it to pleura because the, these are pleural membranes. So you kind of have to blow it up. But look in blue right here. Blue, this lines the lung directly, so it's the visceral pleura, whereas the red one, which is superficial, lines the pleural cavity, and so it's the parietal pleura. So we have parietal and visceral. And this one's a lot harder to see, but again, if you look here where my mouse is, that's the actual wall of the cavity, and you see it's lined by the parietal peritoneum. But then down here, if you look at this darker green one right here that lines the outer surface of these organs, whatever they happen to be, these probably are the intestines down here, it's lining the organs, so those are the visceral peritoneum. Okay, so remember, you just need to keep in mind that peritoneum is for the abdominal pelvic cavity, pleura are for the lungs, and pericardium are for the heart, and then just remember that parietal always lines the wall of the cavity and is most superficial, visceral lines the organ itself and is the deepest, I guess we could say. All right, those are our serous membranes. All right, now I'm not going to go in a whole lot of detail here because I think these pictures serve a thousand words, and you'll be asked to do this in lab. But we have two kinds of uh, d divisions of the abdominal pelvic areas that you need to know for the quizzes and exams. Over here on the left, we have what are called abdominal pelvic regions, and notice there's nine of them. Over here on the right, we have abdominal pelvic quadrants. Quad means four. These are the, really the easiest to remember because there's a right and a left and an upper and a lower, and you just combine them to make the combinations. For example, this one right here in my mouse is, that's the left upper quadrant. Now remember, right and left, remember we're still getting used to this, but left has to do with the patient's perspective. So you're looking on their anterior, but from their perspective, this is their left side where my mouse is. And so it's the upper one, so it's the left upper quadrant. Likewise, down here across the X, so to speak, down here is their right side, and it's the lower one. So this is the right lower quadrant. And you should probably be aware of some of the organs that are in each quadrant. For example, left upper quadrant. Here's the stomach right here. We have the upper aspect of the colon uh, right here in some of the small intestines, I guess. In the right upper quadrant, we have the gallbladder, which is in green. We've got the liver. We've got some of the stomach. But mainly in the lower quadrants, we have the intestines, both large and small. Okay, so just be aware of generally what's in each one of those. Again, these are more difficult over here for the abdominal pelvic regions because there's nine of them. All right? Now again, you have right over here and you have left over here, but they kind of have weird names. All right, so on the left side, we have at the top left hypochondriac region, and going down left lumbar region, and at the bottom left iliac region. Okay, So going down hypochondriac, lumbar, and iliac. We have the same thing on the right side. Up here is the right hypochondriac, this is the right lumbar, and the right iliac. And on the right side we have right hypochondriac, right lumbar, and right iliac region. And then in the middle going down, these aren't named in any of the same ways, really. We have epigastric right here. This is the umbilical region. You can imagine the belly button's probably in this area somewhere. And then hypogastric region, all right? And to some extent, you should be aware of some of the organs that might be in each of these. Um, mainly understand that the liver is going to be in the epigastric and right hypochondriac. The stomach is shared by the left hypochondriac and the epigastric. And in general, these other regions really have mostly the intestines, both large and small.
okay? But just make sure, most importantly, that you can identify each of these nine over here and each of these four over here, because some typical quiz and exam questions could be something like, you have an arrow pointed to one of these, and you have to say which one it is. This is umbilical region over here, or this one right here is right upper quadrant, all right? And you'll have activities where you cover some of these in class today. All right, so this has been an overview of the major concepts from exercise two in the Anatomy and Physiology Lab Manual. Um, we're gonna be covering all of this today in class. So again, you can use this to study for the quizzes and the exams. Um, I will see you in class today, and then also tomorrow we will cover exercise three. Thank you.